you, Mr. Shima, and thank you to council. That I would ask the uh, attorneys in one two four two three six, State of Kansas versus Ford, to please come forward. Good morning, your honors, and may it please the court. Kai Mann of the Appellate Defender's Office on behalf of the appellant, Marlon Ford. Um, I know I just said, but just to confirm, may I please have three minutes for rebuttal? Thank yes. you very much. Yes. Always good to make sure, right? Well, I, I will say, actually, my first hot trip at this court, I forgot to ask, and I certainly didn't get it, so I'm pretty sure every <laughs> other time. <laughs> may it please the court. Marlon's Ford conviction is the result of a jury making a decision on a vague statute without the whole law following a highly objectionable closing ar argument. These, commissions, these conditions demand reversal individually and cumulatively. Mr. Ford's conviction of rape is reversible because the prosecution erred in closing argument, because the district court failed to instruct the jury fully regarding the law on rape, and because the Ka Kansas rape statute is unconstitutionally vague. Now, I'm prepared to discuss each e discuss each and every one of these issues, but I would like to start with prosecutorial error unless this court has any objections. The state in this case, they took the concept of force necessary to be convicted of a rape and stretched it beyond any sort of recognizable bound in this case. The state told the jury that Mr. Ford was exercising force when he was driving from Kansas City, Kansas down to Wichita, exercising force from nearly another state line, exercising force again while he was calling her while she was in a locked building to let him up. Again, exercising force by a mere phone call when she's in a locked building, guarded by people on, on patrol to, to not let bad things happen, not forcible. And furthermore, and even more egregiously, the state told the jury that he continues to exert force when he asks if they can have sex. When we're dealing with rape and when non-consent is an element of one of those, with, of, of, of that crime, how can asking somebody for consent to avoid rape and to avoid, you know, any sort of negative sexual practice be an exercise of force. It just doesn't make sense. And this just stretches the, the element of force beyond any re reasonable and recognizable definition. Now, the reason the prosecution felt that they could do this is because the Kansas appellate courts have never, ever tried to even attempt to put any sort of limit on what force is. Instead, in Borthwick, this court has has just said, and this has been carried forward throughout, that the that the amount of force required to sustain a rape is uh, is is highly subjective, and it can't be given it any 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 sort of of reasoning. In fact, you know the full quote. I have it here. The force required to sustain a rape conviction in this state does not require that the rape victim resist to the point of becoming a victim of other crimes such as battery or aggravated assault. KSA 3502 does not require the state to prove that the that a rape victim told the defender she did not consent, physically resisted the defender, and then endured sexual intercourse against her will. It does not require that a victim be physically overcome, overcome by force in the form of beating or physical restraint. It requires only a finding that she did not give consent and the victim was overcome by force or fear facilitating the sexual intercourse. That last sentence is correct. But we, what this case shows is that there has to be some limit to the term force. Again, the state is, is claiming Mr. Ford was exercising force from essentially the Missouri state line. I'm sure he ate breakfast that, that morning. Those calories are fueling him. Was that now a forcible breakfast because he was going to go down there that night? The, the state essentially, they, they, they try to find a point where they can pick and see a force. And I, then I have two questions. I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt. Um, the first question is, would you agree in Kansas that the law um, and for some reason, I don't have the case that you cited, but State v. Tully um, and State v. Cheney, that force in the context of rape is a highly subjective concept as, that does not lend itself to definition as a matter of law. 
and whether a victim is overcome by force is a finally is a finding only the jury is entitled to make. That's the current status of the law in Kansas, correct? Correct. Okay. And then the next thing is, and I, and I understand that in the closing argument that that is exactly what the prosecutor argued um, about, you know, the the force started when he left Kansas City, um, calling her. But the prosecutor later argued that the defendant, uh, you know, well, within the same discussion, that the prosecutor, that the defendant used force by pinning her arms down, lifting her shirt, um, pressing her face, pulling her pants down, and other restricting movements. So read in context, when you're looking at all of it, um, would you agree that the prosecutor's statements didn't in, improperly attempt to define force? No, Your Honor, I wouldn't. I would say that those that those comments focusing on, you know, the allegations of the penning and the forcing of the legs and those things, clearly force. But where the prosecutor, and, the, and again, the prosecutor could have stopped there. It's not like they didn't have any evidence of force and they were trying to face it. This is a he said, she said. She said evidence provides a lot of force. But where the prosecutor erred is that just wasn't good enough for him. They had to find this force goes all the way back to Kansas City, goes all the way back. And that's how the jury gets confused. And as we saw, the jury was clearly confused in this case. They asked for a statutory definition of rape. They asked for a readback of both parties and they announced a split verdict. So had the state just actually stuck with what force is and not tried to drag the force element back several hours to where they were hundreds of miles apart from each other, then, then, then they might have an argument for a clean conviction. But making this argument, that just takes every other force element out. Because what the state did is that said, well, there's force down here. So everything leading up during that day is force. And that's just silly. And that just can't be the way. And if that is true, and if this is true in context, then I think we get into a huge vagueness problem because if force truly is so subjective and so individualized that we cannot give a standard and it's only for juries, how is that not failing to apply an explicit well, standard? Let me just say, is force just defined and in, in, in the or confined? to physical force why can't there be psychological force i think there can which could certainly start in kansas city driving to wichita with the with the phone contact why, but, why can't that be a part of of the whole nature of force because it's also force to overcome the victim and i don't see how anybody calling repeatedly from a locked building with staff to allow to not allow visitors and unwanted people to come up, how that can be forced to overcome. And furthermore, when we look at the definition of force, if we take the force as, you know, argued by the state or in, in the in the closing argument, and we look to the force um, with 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 their subsection E argument, I'm kind of mixing these two together. But we have a situation here where the force and the fear can be wholly personal to the victim, not emanating from the defendant and known to nobody else but the victim. But I, counsel, you just said that that force is individualized with the victim. Correct? No, that, that 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 is our current that is our current state law. I, I I think that I think we should be looking at force from a reasonable perspective, not from whether this person claims they have force and we can't do anything about it because it's so subjective, but whether a reasonable person in this situation would find some would find some sort of force. Isn't force always going to be a matter of individualized context? I mean, yes, but words also have meaning. And if we look to the dictionary de definitions of force I cited in my brief, they they all talk about power, violence, strength. Even if we look to our def to our definition of forcible felony in Kansas under 215111N, that defines forcible felony as any felony involving the use or or the threat or use or threat of physical force or violence. So I think unless there is an actual something coming from the defendant that there is going to be a negative outcome that there is going to be some harm again be it psychological be it financial be it physical but where we have the situation now is that between the subsection e and the way the state is arguing force is that force can be anything as long as it's connected to something that they claim is a so is it your position then that force only takes should take into consideration the context of the what the defendant is doing and not a, of its effect on the person that he's having sex with. No, I think it needs to take in. I think it needs to take into account both. Where we're at now is that a defendant could give somebody a present, right? And somebody could say, "Oh, I feel the need to have intercourse with this person. I don't want to. I don't want to, but 
I, they gave me a present. I have no idea. No, I did a nice act. I gave a present. But under subsection E and the way that the state is arguing force in this case, that can become rape. What I'm saying is that the force has to be known to both parties. It can't be something that a defendant, I, and again, I know that this isn't my case, but the case that's on the unpublished calendar, NIN, from my reading of that case, the force or fear was wholly, wholly come to and imagined up by the victim. And if that's the case, if there's nothing that the defendant does to put that force or fear that aura out there, then I don't say how we can, I, I just don't know how that survives vagueness and turns every sexual encounter in the state into a very, very fraught proposition. But the state has the burden to prove the force or fear, right? Right. Okay, so when you're cross-examining the witness, you don't say, did you feel force or fear? Yes. I mean, a jury is going to be like, that's not evidence. You know, I mean, they're going to have to go into what did you, you know, what what was the force or fear? Right. No, and again, and, and that's fine. And in this case. So isn't it implicit within that? Like, well, I was fearful that, um, you know, I mean, if it's some ridiculous thing. I mean, isn't the reasonableness kind of implicit within that? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, but it, it, I mean, if force is, fo is phone calls, if force is asking for consent and that's good enough, then no, then then that's why this is prosecutorial error, because any sort of reasonable bounds and conceptualization of force was just ran right over like a Mack truck by this state. But you're you know, you're really focusing on, you know, this, you know, these couple of sentences, but. The prosecutor argued the force was pinning the arms, lifting the shirt, pressing his face, her face, his face into hers, pulling her pants down and all these other restrictive I, movements. I, so I, is this just not the right case for you to make that argument? Because abso absolutely not, because the state could have focused their force argument on force. But what the state did is they took force and they said that everything that coming before that is actually force. So whether or not you believe him, if you believe Mr. Ford, about what happened in that room, they could still convict him by finding he forcibly drove, by finding that he forcibly asked him for, for consent, by finding that he forcibly, again, drove. No, because had the had the thing been limited, then we have a credibility determination and my client is found not guilty. I'm having trouble figuring out which analytical silo to put the arguments into, and maybe they fit into two. But are you arguing that the prosecutor made a uh, misstated the law by making this argument or are you arguing that the prosecutor drew unreasonable inferences from the evidence i am arguing that i it, it's both i i i I've, I've explicitly briefed it that the prosecution misstated the law regarding force my secondary argument if what they said is fine then we've got an unconstitutionally vague statute because nobody can protect themselves from force there. However, if they are drawing inferences that are impermissible, then that is equally, equally prosecutorial error. But in my mind, if what the prosecutor said in closing argument, we've got a major statutory problem that is going to ensnare a lot of people in a very serious level of crime. And is that true when we think about our broader context of criminal law of essentially the perpetrator takes the victim as they find them? Um, you know, if that perpetrator puts into motion a, a chain of events that has a causation that would lead to psychological force, why is that not consistent with a lot of other uh, principles of criminal liability? Because there is because there is no principal psychological force here. Simply driving down is not force enough, especially when you're in a place that is locked well, with staff to put yeah. people up there. What if? in each of the instances uh, that you object to, the prosecutor had used the word fear instead of force. Then I then I still think that that, that is stretching this beyond any recognizable, that basically the state is having it to where- Why? Because, because there has to be some way a person can engage in sexual intercourse without, with, with knowledge that they are not per performing rape. And under this, the argument of the state, combined with their interpretation of subsection E in the new statute, that just can't happen. I, 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 I could ask somebody out for a date, somebody could ask me up, but they could say, hey, in their head, they could be thinking, you know, I really don't want to have sexual intercourse, but I like this person. And I'm afraid that if I do not have sexual intercourse with them, I'll never see them again. And we go through sexual intercourse, they consent. Have I committed rape? Under un, under the state's theories, I have. And I just think that that is wildly, wildly dangerous. And this court should not let that stand.
and I see I'm out of time. I have no more remarks, but I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Gillette? May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Lance Gillette on behalf of the state of Kansas. I'll focus the majority of my time today on the prosecutorial error issues uh, as well, unless this court has other questions. Um, I will also uh, definitely mention uh, my conditional cross appeal in this case. Um, respectfully, I think the last hypothetical that was just that was just articulated proves that defendant's argument fails uh, because what he described was a scenario in which the person doesn't want to doesn't want to have sex, doesn't want to have sex, but really likes him, but then chooses to consent. And that's the key here. Sexual intercourse is a uniquely intimate act, and consent must be present at all times from all parties participating in that act. It is that simple. That is what the statute provides for. Um, if effectively, that's what uh, KSA uh, the rate, our rape statute subsection E makes absolutely clear. We are not playing the games from Bunyard and Flynn anymore. Uh, our legislature has made that clear. Properly viewed in context here, the prosecutor's arguments regarding force or fear were all appropriate. That, I mean, so I take it you agree with the way the court of appeals resolved this. Absolutely. When they said the prosecutor's use of the word force not a statutory use of the word. And I just wonder if you think that really holds water. I mean, the jury was instructed on force. Correct. correct. And the statute uses the word force. Correct. So it strikes me as, I'll use the word problematic, for the, for the prosecutor to repeatedly use the word force and then just say, well, well I wasn't talking about the law. I think we have to look at, again, we have to understand the context here, and, and the word force is not defined in statute. It is defined in our case law it's as, as opposing counsel. Would you, I guess, just practically common sense question, wouldn't, if, if, if you or we imagine a reasonable person sitting in the jury box, wouldn't they, why wouldn't they think that the prosecutor was talking about the force that I've just been instructed on, the force that's reflected in the statute? Because we have to understand the context. And what we started, what we start with here is we're talking about where the defendant began his force. He, she's not explicitly tying that to the actual act of rape, what made defendant guilty of the crime of rape. She was <clears throat> describing a constant escalation of force, the psychological force, which I believe opposing counsel has even agreed can be a form of force. This began with manipulation. It continued to a point where he put her in an impossible situation. Opposing counsel wants to talk about a lock building, et cetera, but what is the victim going to do when a friend of multiple years is telling her, I'm going to freeze out here in my car? She lets him in. There's refusing consent. He, he asks the question, we fucking and she said absolutely not that's not what's going to happen it proceeds she falls asleep she's tried to help a friend and wakes up with him physically raping her on top that's what the prosecutor's comments were all taken in context and i guess the additional thing that i that i'd want to point out well and let me just read you one sure line the prosecutor says that the defendant's force did not start in the victim's bedroom the force started when he left the Kansas City area against her wishes. That's him exerting force over her decision-making ability. I mean, is that a correct statement of the law of rape? Again, I don't think that in context she's she's trying to state the law in regards to rape. She is tying... That's what you have to hang your hat on in this argument, is that we should not read that as a statement of law. That kind of circles back to my original question, <clears throat> which is, wouldn't isn't that exactly how the jury would have understood it? 
I don't think that that's how the jury would have understood it. I would think the jury would have understood it because she tied it expressly to the facts that that's what she was talking about. She's not trying to make a defined, a definite statement of law. And the reason for that is because rape is subjective, as we all agree here. Each individual will have a different threshold for what constitutes force or fear. That's all the prosecutor is talking about here. We have a particularly vulnerable victim based on the way that the defendant set this up, pressured her uh, over the span of two days, and then proceeded to, as she, as two things, as he starts doing this to obtain his objective by any means. And that's what the prosecutor was talking about here. And then, as was pointed out several times, this does escalate to the physical force that is actually applied um, in the bedroom here. I guess I would also note that properly viewed in context, these arguments about force also directly touched on credibility and that defendant, this defendant's intent to obtain his objective by any force. So I don't think it is fair to criticize, to characterize this as a, as a statement of law. It certainly is not akin to, as opposing counsel has briefed, trying to define reasonable doubt. She's not trying to define force. She's saying this, the facts of this case show that force was applied, beginning with manipulation and pressure and escalating to physical force. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I would note it's also, I think, respectfully, I think it's telling that- I mean, fa that, factually, I, I understand that argument, but legally, uh, is there a temporal or some sort of limitation when you then dump it into the actual instructional language or the language of the statute? I think, or, or is our appellate authority that it's just an undefinable factual question? Um, I, I would begin with it, it is an undefinable factual question. I don't think this court should delve into telling individuals what may or may not constitute force for them because it is so highly subjective. There is a world of difference amongst individuals in this state. And he simply cannot craft a singular definition that would that would define force for every single individual. And then to your second question regarding the temporal nature, I think that the the correct way to answer that is it depends on the facts of the case. Um, the the, the temp uh, I'll briefly touch on Nin. It was an unpublished case that I know that this court accepted the petition for review on. Neither party has uh, followed any kind of a supplemental. Um, notice or about that, but I know it's on this court's uh, summary docket today. It, I think, is an example that is distinguishable from this case in two ways. First, in Nin, factually, what was talked about there was, were events that occurred over years. And the initiation there, there wasn't necessarily any indication of actual pressure. It was, quote unquote, grooming touching, something that may not have been understood by the victim at that time, but that was not necessarily even psychological force because it was not understood. It's also, I think, legally distinguishable because when we talk about grooming, it can constitute a number of different things, many of which would not constitute force, as I said, something that may not be understood at all. Uh, so I think that's an that's an example that I think would answer your question as far as the temporal connection. Um, if there are no other questions regarding that, I think it's also worth noting that what we see here is that this, the state has tried to put the argument in the best context it can based on what a jury would have understood and what's seen here. And what we have on the contrary is a defendant in his second argument, second or third argument about prosecutorial error, claim that the state argued, quote, the fo only force necessary for rape is the act of intercourse itself. Those words don't appear anywhere in this <laughs> record. Quite to the contrary, we are just, this case is highly distinguishable from that kind of an argument that occurred in Bunyard. Um, I think that's telling of what we have here. We have, we have what a jury would have seen in this case versus what a defendant would like this court to see after the fact based on a subjective uh, interpretation that may or may not be actually even linked to the record. 
Can, can you speak to your cross appeal? Sure. Uh, I'm I'm in, I'm interested in that, and and I guess let kind of lay out: is this case even a pro? I I know you say a modified Bunyard instruction is no longer applicable given the current state of our and the amendment to the rape law, sure. but. Even if it is, is it factually appropriate in this case? Uh, in those uh, distinguishing Bunyard and the other case to this case, <clears throat> is that there was consensual sexual activity between the two. Here, there really either was or there wasn't. There isn't an agreement that there was consensual activity on the part of the victim in this case. Does that make a difference here? I, I think it does to a certain extent. Um, but I'll explain why I think that this court can and should take the opportunity to address the legal question. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm thinking factually, why does it even fit? But go ahead. Sure. So to be clear, um, a modified Bunyard instruction provided that rape may occur even though consent was given to the initial penetration, only if that consent is withdrawn, that withdrawal is communicated to the defendant, and the sexual intercourse continues when the victim is over, when the victim is overcome by force or fear. There's about five different things that have to go into that. But here, unfortunately, I, though this this instruction, oh, a it was not requested below, uh, so it's not preserved. The defendant never even attempted to carry his burden to demonstrate uh, clear error until uh, a passing attempt in a, a reply brief and then in his petition. But no, to answer your question directly, no, it's not fact. It wouldn't have been factually appropriate here. That's there where is... I'm kind of having trouble even getting to it. it <laughs> Mr. Mann can certainly yeah. address this too in his rebuttal, but this um, is the fit. So th it's not factually appropriate because the victim was clear there was never consent and that there was force here. Um, even in the defendant's varied accounts, there's never a description of a factual scenario that would fit under Bunyard. I think that this court can and still should reach the question of whether or not it's legally appropriate because that's the clear error rubric. rubric. We have to answer that question first. And respectfully, it's time we have an answer to that question. Bunyard opened a door that frankly would be terrifying, that Cannon was terrifying for a number of individuals. It was vague. It was created by judicial fiat. Flynn tried to walk that back, but left open a number of vagaries and concerns that could have still left victims subject to additional force, harm, battery, etc. That's not required for a rape, but a defendant could still play dumb, essentially, or be more violent and then play dumb because he could try to benefit from that. He or she could try to benefit from that. But it's it's important here because in Flynn, this court drew the line that it would only apply to rapes prior to July 1st that occurred prior to July 1st, 2011. Since that time, we've had KSA 2155.03e. It is about as clear as a statute can be. It shall not be a defense that the def offender did not know or have reason to know that the victim did not consent to the sexual intercourse, that the victim was overcome by force or fear, or that the victim was unconscious or physically powerless. I would note that that does also make an exception. To, uh, it doesn't apply to A2 where we're talking about certain types of rape. Um, this language does apply to, to <clears throat> the law as charged in this case. And I think it is important um, to be clear that it would not have been legally appropriate because it is also possible in certain cases where I guess one could try to argue, though not here, that might have been factually appropriate or, or and legally appropriate, or that it may have been uh, factually warranted, but not legally sound, vice versa. It's just it's just a matter of, of needing clarity. And on that point, yes. I want to ask a pretty theoretical question about the statute itself. Um, and I'm struggling to figure out, I, I know it, the way the statute is set up, it, it's easy to just read the statute and say, well, these are the elements of the crime is, but, but are the subsections under a one, are they really elements? In other words, force or fear, or are they, do they actually function as essentially statutorily mandated evidence of lack of lack of consent? 
I, they are elements. So if they're elements, the, my follow-up question is, that would suggest that there is such a thing as non-consensual sexual intercourse in Kansas that is not rape. And is that, can, is that right? I, get, I might need to, I might need a little bit of clarification because the only circumstance in which I could see that would be under subsection A2, and it would require very unique evidence, and it would probably require evidence from a defendant themselves. That's not necessarily a burden shifting, so I, that's not accurate, but it, it would require very unique evidence about mental capacity or uh, incapacitation due to some kind of a substance. That's the only realm I could see that in, where a defendant can still try to claim a lack of knowledge. The other elements, the other subsections, one, three, four, five, those you cannot try to claim a lack of knowledge or, or ignorance at, at this point. They just seem, it, it seems repetitive, I guess. I mean, if there's no consent, that's, no that's consent. what I'm trying to figure out is the reading the statute. We have consent, lack of consent, obviously, that is the central, you know, one of the two central elements of the crime. Mm -hmm. Um, so what does being overcome by force or fear really add to the equation? What is being over? Um, it other than evidence, it's, it's it's evidence that there was no consent. It's it's really duplicative though of the lack of consent as a legal matter, isn't it? I, I guess I'd start by saying even if it is, I don't think that that I don't think it matters. But at the same time, I think what what it's describing is. There is this concept of consent. It is individualized. But then <clears throat> to overcome it requires force or fear. That would require additional evidence, specifically that that individual's threshold for consent was overcome. That's the best way. I, I think that's the correct way to answer that question. Um. I see I'm out of time. Um, if there are other or any other questions, I, I would welcome them. And if not, I, I would just leave the court with the fact that force and fear is highly subjective, and we should stick to that. We should enforce that. That has been the law in Kansas for a very long time, and nothing's changed about people other than the fact that we now recognize more clearly that the individual's rights should matter. So you have to prove lack of consent and you have to prove lack of force or you have to prove the existence of force Correct. that overcame consent. Correct. So if, if on cross-examination, a victim, and there's, there's overwhelming evidence of lack of consent, but if on cross-examination, the victim is, um, answers questions from defense counsel to the effect of, no, I wasn't afraid, no, there was no force, then that's not guilty as a matter of law. It's it's not not guilty as a matter of law because you're at, that that evidence would have to be tested based on the credibility of the victim. And that, okay, well, that's let's, always just, been the let's case. just assume the jury believes the victim. Then you're saying not guilty. If the jury believed the victim in that circumstance. The jury then, can believe that there was no consent, but it's still not a rape. That, that I mean... You see what I'm sort of driving. I see, at I see kind of. I kind of see what you're driving at. Um, but I think the answer is, um, I guess the answer to that would be it, no, because we have to prove that all these things exist at the same time. That would mean it's an element. If it's an element, you yeah. have to prove it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And if there are no other questions, I appreciate this court's time. I would ask that the the court of appeals ruling in this. Be upheld with the exception of my conditional cross petition. Thank you all for your time. <clears throat> May it please the court. Uh, I would like to start uh, first. I know I've got a lot to cover, but as far as preservation of the modified Bunyard instruction, Flynn was a one issue case. The only issue in that case was whether or not a Bunyard instruction kept going. So the fact that this court, that the district court discussed Flynn for five, six pages, and I can't argue Flynn and proper application on, on Flynn on appeal, that instruction is preserved or there are major problems with our preservation precedent. Uh, secondly, with factual appropriateness, the factual appropriateness of that instruction is triggered on the withdrawal of consent. 
So where was their withdrawal of consent? And Mr. Ford's testimony, he testified. He said we stopped. Yes. Is, is that stopping is what? withdrawal of consent? When she said stop and he stopped, that is withdrawal of consent. Yes. Stop having sex with me is withdrawal of consent. That, that, that is the classic withdrawal of consent. I thought the quote was ended abruptly. I, I, you know, I, his testimony, if you read his testimony, I don't have it up here right now, but his testimony is that we had consensual sexual intercourse for about half a minute to a minute. And when she said, stop, I stopped and left. There are two stories in this case. A victim is not presumed credible, is not presumed to be telling the truth any more than anybody else. Mr. I, Ford deserves to believe. And that's why this, but no, no, that's I, why I was looking at your no, client's testimony. I wasn't, yeah. I, again, that, that's the way I read it. I, that's the way I read it. The, the instruction is triggered on the withdrawal of consent because if they can find that he stopped at the withdrawal of consent and did not go further, they acquit him. That's why this is factually appropriate. That's why this is so key. The jury requested readbacks of both parties. Well, this was why, not an Why easy wouldn't question. they do the same thing under the instructions that were given? Because they were obviously confused. They did not know statutory definition of rape because the statutory definition of rape doesn't cover post-consent or post-penetration withdrawal of consent. As this court recognized in Bunyard and Flynn, why those instructions exist for the first place. And secondly, they asked for a definition. They were confused. They asked for readbacks showing that they were weighing this credibility and that they were initially split. Under any, even if this is clear air, even if this is clear under Burke's dresser, what more can somebody show? that a jury was having problems with this and that an accurate, accurate instruction informing them on the whole law of the subject would have returned an acquittal on a level one case on my client's only conviction. Address uh, Justice Stegall's. Absolutely. Uh, hypothetical. Person A threatens person B. I'm going to kill your children if you do not have go have sex with person C. Person B does not want their children to die goes and have sex with person C. Is person C guilty of, of rape, even though there was no, B did not truly consent. That consent was only by compulsion. Again, consent and force and fear are heavy. Sexual intercourse ranges from a lot of different factual well, scenarios, I, especially with young people. We need to be clear. I we need to protect it, everybody. I hate to interrupt, but I think that's a different question. I think Justice Stegall's question was, I didn't really consent, but I'm not afraid. And I don't feel forced. The, the, no, that would not be rape because there are three elements of rape. If that's true, then isn't it an uh, isn't it evidence that is relevant and probative, thus material? If she says no, don't come, and he says I'm coming anyway, isn't that evidence of? I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want. That's if we, force, if, isn't it? If we interpret the evidence this way, again, we're starting from his position that we're believing her. But he said, I was invited. He said, I've never been to Wichita. Okay, but and the, no, but the jury struggled with this. They had readbacks of both parties. If you read these, if you read these testimonies individually and you believe her, you're not asking to read back for anything. So this was such a close case. We have an instruction that clearly covers this exact situation that is not negated by subsection E because Mr. Ford's defense is I didn't, is not, I was unsure. His his defense is there was no rape. But this can, was consensual sex. But can you answer my question though? Which is, and he said to himself, I don't care whether you want me to come or not. I'm coming anyway. I, I, I'm, that, isn't that a mindset of, Force. I can't agree with that because that's not what our record reflects with my client's testimony. If I were just going to believe what the victim were going to say, then I don't know what I would be doing here. Can't the jury infer that? They that's can, but, but the inferences we got on this record when they asked for a readback shows that it was a much closer than that. And that's why we need that extra instruction. And that's why the state's prosecutorial error was so harmful because they took the jury who was very closely divided on a question of credibility and the lack of instruction and the prosecutorial's closing error just destroyed anything. And just one last thing. But I, I'd like to ask yeah. a question. Okay, so I want to get back to this legal appropriateness. Um, so we know what the the modified Bunyard instruction uh, says, mm -hmm. and you know, it's consent is withdrawn. Okay, so that's already, you know, the consent is already an element of the crime, so that's no big mm -hmm. deal. And then um, the third one is. The sex continues when the victim is overcome by force or fear. That's already an element of the crime. Um, but the B, the, the second one, withdrawal is communicated to the defendant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this directly conflicts with 215503E, 
I, I disagree. Um, because there is, uh, E says that it's not a defense that the defendant know whether or not there's consent, right? Is that true? The way I read that is that the defender did not know or have reason to know that the victim did not consent. Here, we have knowledge that they did consent. No, I'm just talking. I know, I know but, 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 in a, but in a bunch of situation. No, you, you don't know what I'm saying because I didn't finish my sentence, okay. which is that not looking at the facts of this case, I'm just looking purely at the law and whether this is a legally appropriate instruction, okay, that in order to give this instruction in a, a post-penetration case, withdrawal of consent is communicated to defendant. When we have subsection E that says it is not a defense that defendant know whether or not the victim consented. I don't understand why in a post-penetration case Number one, you're you're totally confusing the jury because you're giving both of those instructions. And then number two, what, why, you know, why are we drawing a line there? Because the prosecutor has the burden to prove that there was no consent. But in a post-penetration case, a person has consent and then they're having sexual intercourse. But the prosecutor doesn't have to prove anything about I, I, no i, I know well, it, may i finish my it, sentence oh, yeah, yes, yes yes thank you um but we're not focusing on the consent part because that's not the crime right so you could just ignore all that i mean what we're focusing on what the prosecutor has to prove is no consent the prosecutor has to prove all the elements simultaneously and if you have consent but the other two but then consent magically comes in. You have to prove that they all exist simultaneously per 517 or 5107F. Now, what happens here in a, in a post-penetration case is that consent's taken care of. You have consent or else it wouldn't be withdrawn. Now, this is why, if that is true, that if, if, if a person can give consent, withdraw that consent mentally and silently without ever saying anything, then that's why we have a vague statute because that sets the stage for any person to have sexual intercourse and then later say, no. I, I changed my mind halfway through and I was scared halfway through. Right, but, 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 but the prosecutor would have to prove that. So let's talk about how does a prosecutor prove that all of a sudden the victim's not consenting anymore? By the victim saying, I told them to stop and they kept going. By Bunyard and Flynn. Right, Flynn. okay. I no. told him to stop and he kept going. Yes. And so in implicit within that is now that the defendant knew you know, I mean, that is, it's communicated. Right. Well, let's think about other ways. But, How else can the prosecutor, besides this communication? I mean, like like he talked about defendant trying to play dumb or force. If you're playing dumb, and I, this is even kind of, shouldn't even have to say this, but if you have to play dumb to not notice somebody's withdrawing consent, or you have to use violence to silence somebody, as they said in the brief, that's right. You know there's not consent or else you wouldn't be playing dumb or else you wouldn't be using violence. Subsection E read literally and strictly, as in your hypothetical, creates an incredibly vague statute by which anybody can be guilty of rape after any sexual intercourse. No, there because if, you, if you're there and you consent and then all of a sudden you think, I don't want to do this anymore. And you don't communicate it, you don't push them off. You don't do anything. You've just changed your mind in your head. How is a prosecutor going to prove withdraw of consent to a jury? Are, no, I, I, I think we might be talking about two couple of different things here because I'm talking about a situation. Consent is given. A victim withdraws their consent. A victim can just testify to that. I mean, there, there's no consentometer. You know, there's no. Right. But if I right. say it, but if I'm the victim and I say, right. I changed my mind and I didn't want to do it anymore. Say that. Right. Yeah. Okay. But how. By, by having the victim testify to that. And that's why this 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 instruction is so key is because these are credibility determinations. 
and you can't do you, make. Do you think a jury would convict on that? You know, a juries convict on things that I see all the time. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Like I said, we all like to pretend we know what juries do. And that's part of my problem with our current clear air analysis, because we don't. We really don't. And we just assume as knowing, pretending to know what juries would do. We just can't do. I can say what juries might do. I can say what one juror would be more likely to do than the other, which is why we need to wrap a probability standard back into Burke's dresser and the clear air standard. But no, I, I honestly can't say what a jury do. All I know. Okay, so let's let's just take it a little bit further. OK, so if we make this rule for post penetration. I mean, it, OK, and um, and I'm the victim and uh, and I don't consent from the beginning. And so I go to a nurse and, you know, and so I've had intercourse and the prosecutor says, uh, did you consent to this? No, I, I never wanted to have sex. Did you communicate that? Did you push the person off? Did you do? No, but in my head, I did not consent, but I don't get that instruction, right? Because it's not post penetration changed my mind. Why would we differentiate between me not consenting from the beginning versus me changing my mind post-penetration? Because if a person has sex with you with the, without your consent and they're committing rape, but if a person has consensual sex with you and then you withdraw consent, then that turns to rape. It, 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 it's a matter of consensual sex turning to rape as opposed to rape all the way through. That's but if I but if I say at the very beginning, I didn't consent, but I didn't communicate, I didn't do it, you know. But but there's no instruction given at the beginning. That no, I, no. But I mean, but the but the instruction is that I mean that's just the regular rape instruction. The victim did not consent, and a post and and, and, and a post. But, it, but this thing, this second thing that says withdrawal is communicated to defendant. So withdrawal of consent is communicated to defendant. Why aren't we telling the jury in my hypothetical that from the beginning that my non-consent is communicated to the defendant? Why aren't we requiring that instruction be given, you know, when at the beginning? I, because you can't withdraw something that's not given. But let's take out the withdrawal. Because what we're basically doing is saying in that second thing you have to com communicate the fact that you're not consenting to the defendant. Because you've already given consent. Because because the status quo is consent. And if you got to change that, you've got to let somebody know that. That that that's why because because consent is in place because you already have consent. That's why you have to communicate that or else the defendant is going to know. And you don't have to verbally say it. You can try to push somebody off. You can make actions. I mean, I'm not saying it has to be like wave a red flag three times or fire up a flare. You know, if if the if the situation can turn where somebody reasonably knows that they don't lo no longer have consent, you have to go. But there has to be something because that person is operating under the consent that they were given. Okay. So, final question, yeah. and I know I've gone way over your time. So, you don't believe the fact that you have to communicate that to the defendant that you no longer consent. You don't find that to be to, in complete contradiction to subsection E, which says that it is not a defense that you didn't know that the victim co didn't consent. No, because in the withdrawal of consent cases, the defendant already has affirmative consent. And, They're uh, possessing and, of consent. But this is the plain language of the statute, right? No, I, I know. And, and again, but I no, I, I do not think that those are different because that person was operating under the knowledge that they had consent. And unless they're, something else goes on, they're going to continue to operate under that knowledge. They are having sex with somebody with a person who consented until that withdrawal is communicated. Because how, how else are they The legislature know? should do? Or well, is this something you want us to do? I think that unless this court interprets it that way, that then we have a vague statute, as I've argued in the vagueness section, to where every sort of intercourse is running the risk of, again, and not just a crime, one of the most serious crimes carrying lifetime registration, level one, like rape, big one, you know? Thank so, you so much for answering my questions. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I got a little bit worked up. I think we're just talking past each other. I, oh, sorry, I don't that, think yeah. so. No, okay. you answered my questions. I appreciate <laughs> it. Right. Um, well, I, I, I've been way over time. Um, I don't have anything prepared. Although, Thank you, Chief. 
Thank you to both counsel for your arguments in this case. The court will take the matter under advisement. We